Every day we hear about the importance of metabolism and the role that it plays in our day-to-day -day lives. There's a lot that we're learning about the way metabolism changes, both over time as we age with disease, but in particular in people that are above a healthy weight and the importance of both diet and exercise to changes in metabolism. There's a rapidly emerging field in science called metabolomics that has the potential to really change our understanding of biology, health, and of disease. And today we're gonna to talk about that particular type of science and the understandings that we might be able to gain as to the way we change with diet and exercise, particularly as it relates to people with osteoarthritis. And we're privileged today to have an opportunity to speak to Ron June, a professor and bioengineer based at Montana State University, and also Hope Wellhaven, a recently graduated PhD student at Montana State University about the role of the metabolome in osteoarthritis. Hello, Hope, Ron, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you, it's good to be here. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure of mine. You've got a beautiful backdrop there, Ron, and so hopefully at some point in time, I'll get to come and see the thing in real life, and you can explain what I'm talking about in a moment. But I guess before we digress too much further, in the first instance, Hope, if you don't mind, can you just share with the listeners a little bit more about your background and what a typical day looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So recently, I actually defended my PhD back in March and graduated this May, actually about two weeks ago, which is really exciting. So my days have looked a lot different recently, um, a lot of relaxing since I've been done. But usually I'm in the lab where I'm in Dr. Ron June's lab, where I focus on osteoarthritis or OA. And we specifically look at the metabolism of the disease. And so that's kind of been my bread and butter the last few years. And so usually my typical day to day, I can either be found in the lab or analyzing a lot, a lot of data. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Wonderful. Now, I'm hoping at some point in time, we're going to talk about the effects of gravity. But before we get on to, <laughs> to gravity, Ron, can you just tell us a little bit about your background as well? Yeah, so my undergraduate degree was in engineering sciences with a focus on mechanics. And uh, to be honest, I thought that almost to the end of my undergraduate studies, I was going to build nuclear weapons for a career because I thought that was one of the most challenging things you could do with the, that type of degree. And then I took an elective in biomedical engineering and realized that a career in biomedical engineering might make me feel a little bit better about myself. And so then I, I went to grad school in biomedical engineering. I did a lot of cartilage biomechanics work as a grad student. And then I did postdoc work first in uh, uh, Bob Turkletop's rheumatology lab for a year. And then most of my postdoc training was in Steve Dowdy's lab where he did a lot of molecular cell biology and drug delivery. And so then I got to start my own lab at MSU, Montana State University here in 2011, where we kind of combine cell biology and engineering to, to study osteoarthritis. Superb, superb. And Ron, again, without giving away too much political persuasion, I'm not sure if you've watched Oppenheimer, but I would have thought we have enough nuclear weapons, don't you think? I, you know, there, there are a lot of nuclear weapons out there and um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm glad you're doing what you're doing as well. Now, Hope, when you're not at work, slaving away there, what do you like doing? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, you could probably find me like a lot of people in the field. A lot of us ortho um, people, I feel like are all pretty active and love sports. So I'm a washed up college athlete. So you could usually find me either on a run walking my dog, hiking, and doing pretty much anything active, or probably watching some type of sports game, whatever's going on there. Um, but usually pretty active, whether that's myself or watching other people be active by watching sports. So, yeah. And if you had to choose a favorite sport to watch, what would that be? I feel like lately, of course, it would be women's basketball in light of Kaylin Clark, um, absolute stud, as well as the UConn basketball team. Paige Beckers is one of my favorite players because she also tore her ACL, but definitely women's basketball, but I'm super excited to watch the Olympics this summer. And is when you say you're a washed up college athlete, that was track though, right? Rather than basketball? Correct. Yeah. I was a track athlete. I threw the javelin 
Uh, that's always kind of one of my fun facts. Um, hopefully we have sh shoulder osteoarthritis figured out pretty soon because my shoulder is pretty hurt after that. But yeah, I was a track athlete all throughout college. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, for reasons that I don't completely understand, there's actually a couple of good javelin throwers down in Australia as well that have done particularly well yeah. internationally. Yeah. It's a super fun event. Really, really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, Ron, what do you like doing when you're not at work? So I like spending time with my family. I've got uh, three kids between the ages of 12 and 16. And so they're a lot of fun. And then I do a lot of, you know, outdoor sports. And so I love to ski. Since moving to Montana, I've gotten into bow hunting. And um, we actually have a small herd of pack goats for pack trips in the mountains, which are a lot of fun too. What to just explain that a little bit further, because obviously we're not, we're not familiar with goat packing, but yeah. what, is, what is goat packing? So um, traditionally, right, a lot of people in the American West will use horses or donkeys as pack animals. And those are great animals, but they, they, you know, they require a lot of feed and care. Goats, on the other hand, cannot carry as much weight, but they're much more agile and they can eat almost anything. And so there are pack saddles that have panniers on them that you can load with your, you know, your sleeping bag, your tent, your food. And they will, honestly, now that they're well-trained, they just follow us in the mountains, which is great. And so, you know, you walk up the trail, <laughs> the goats follow you, you can set up camp, you tie up the goats, they eat whatever is around them. And it's a great way to see the mountains with, uh, you know, I think they're fairly docile animals, which is, I appreciate compared to other large animals like horses. That's amazing. And do, do the national parks let you walk around with goats in the national parks? So that depends on the specific national park. Unfortunately for us, the closest national park is Yellowstone and they don't allow goats right now. But in the U.S. we have, there are many different flavors, so to speak, of public lands. And so a national forest, as well as most of the Bureau of Land Management land, which is a lot in Montana, uh, you can take goats, which is, is great. Wow. Fantastic. Well, just by way of disclosure, my favorite national park in all of the U.S. having lived there for about 10 years is Glacier. It's spectacular. For anybody who hasn't been there, I'm not sure whether you guys have, but it's it's amazing. Oh, yeah. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. 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 All right. Now, um, obviously, we could probably spend all day talking about that. But just before we flick on to the questions about the topic, just five words that you think aptly describe yourself. Yeah, so that's a really good question. It's a really hard question. And I actually asked some of my friends and family because I had such a hard time with the question. And a lot of people described me as being very creative, hardworking, pretty clever, passionate, as well as inquisitive. I think that would be five. Wonderful qualities. And Ron, <laughs> how about you? I would like to think that I'm thoughtful, uh, creative, hardworking. Um, I think resilient is probably a good word to describe me. And then I would also say uh, optimistic. I think there are great things ahead of us. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, th I think in research and in life, you have to have a decent dose of optimism. <laughs> Otherwise, there is, uh, you know, the perception that there's a lot of headwinds. But, uh, you know, I, I guess I wake up every day grateful that, you know, I've got another wonderful day to look forward to. All right. Now, obviously, this was stimulated by a preprint that I saw come across my desk from the idea study. But I guess before we get into the main contents of the study, primarily because I think a lot of the terminology here may lose our listeners if we don't explain it adequately. Ron, I'm wondering if you can, in the first instance, just tell me a little bit about what is the metabolome? Yeah, that's a, I think that's an important and a wonderful question. I think it's great to get started off um, by explaining kind of the basis of this study. So. The metabolome is the collection of small molecules that are found within some sort of biological system. So, right, humans have many different metabolomes. There are different ones for our muscles versus, you know, our cartilage versus our bone versus the synovial fluid in the joints. There are also metabolomes for bacterial systems uh, and a lot of other ones, but they're the collection of the small molecules that is maybe if we're thinking to chemistry, the reactants and products that make up a broad array of the biochemical reactions that are the fundamental chemistry of life. And so when we do metabolomics, we measure large numbers, 
thousands of these molecules at one time. And so metabolomics is the relative newcomer in the omics space. And so for listeners who've heard of maybe other techniques like proteomics and genomics, proteomics and genomics have a little bit of an easier time with their data analysis. Unfortunately, in metabolomics, there, there are some technical complexities that require additional steps to analyze the data. But the flip side, once you surmount those technical complexities, you can gain really detailed insight into the fundamental processes that that system is using, for instance, to maybe keep your joint healthy or give it osteoarthritis. That's fantastic. And, you know, from a skill set perspective, you know, obviously sounds incredibly complex, but presumably you have to have a reasonable grounding in chemistry, you know, handling big data. Are these things that you've gained over time through exposure to that type of work? Or is it it's it's something that you'd learned somewhere? So for me, when I was a postdoc, uh, UCSD was a wonderful place to be a postdoc. And one of the leading metabolomics labs is at the Scripps Research Institute. And they put on a bunch of free training seminars for postdocs and graduate students that I happened to attend when I was a postdoc. So that kind of, you know, wet my interest in the topic. And then when I was learning about Montana State University, it turns out that we actually have an outstanding mass spectrometry core facility. And so you need some fairly uh, high horsepower instruments, the mass spectrometers to do this. And so we happen to have those. And so when I realized that, I, I figured I have to really jump in head first because I, I think it was, for me, the reason we got into this was because of the power of the technique in terms of describing what's happening in our joints. But it does help to have some background in kind of big data or higher dimensional data analysis statistics. And then there's a lot of fundamental chemistry and biochemistry that help to do the experimental part of things and interpret them. Yeah. And just just by way of background for the listeners, how long does that process usually take? So you've, you've obviously said, you know, I... There's this tool here. It looks fascinating. I want to dig in. How long does that process take from then until now to, I guess, acquire the skills and knowledge and technique to have that? Yeah. So was, I'll start just quickly here. So the very first data set we collected, we had to write all of our own code to analyze it from scratch. And that took about three months to do the data analysis. Now with the code that we've got in the lab, you know, what we did initially in three months, we can do in probably just an hour or two. And we also have additional tools that we get more out of the data now. In terms of training people, you know, I would say it takes students ultimate to get very good at it. It takes at least six months, but within just a couple of weeks, I think now they can begin learning about their data and performing independent analyses. But Hope uh, has a lot more to say about this, I'm sure. Yeah, so I just think about my personal experience with our research and specifically with metabolomics. So I started doing metabolomics when I was an undergraduate researcher. I started when I was a junior in college in Dr. Alyssa Hahn's lab. She actually got her PhD from Ron as well. And so that's when I got exposed to it and I started doing the data um, piece there. And so that was in 2018. And so that was six years ago. I would consider myself an expert now. I probably would have considered myself an expert, you know, in like 2020, but I think with this specific technique and data tool um, and kind of this perspective, you can really learn something almost every day, every month, every year. And it also is a very dynamic field right now. Um, it's booming, very, very, very much just exploding. And so I think as a researcher in the field, we as a whole are really learning more and more every year. And so that's really exciting. It's a really cool place to be. So I think after six years, I would consider myself an expert, but that could really be different depending on also your access to things as well as your resources, like Ron mentioned. Um, but I think something for the listener to recognize is that, you know, it's really easy to get into the nitty gritty chemistry like we're talking about. However, we use a mass spec like Ron mentioned, and people don't realize this, but mass specs are actually a key part of society. Mass specs are almost in every single hospital 
they help us look at, let's say, a blood sample from a baby that's born. We can then look at their blood for different indicators of, of, of disease using mass spec. Mass specs are in space, they're in airports. So really they're, they're everywhere, but we just don't really notice it. And so I think people like us totally see it. However, they might be around you more than you think. So that's a really exciting thing to also notice and recognize. Yeah, fantastic. And hopefully that gives people a better handle on the technology and, and what's involved in what you've just done in this study, because obviously we're going to highlight one example, but it, there are obviously huge opportunities for uh, exploiting this particular methodology elsewhere. Now, I guess I got stimulated by this particular paper because I think this is probably the pivotal weight loss study that's out there. And so this is, we're going to be focusing now a little bit on the idea study, which was led by Steve Messier and the group at, at Wake Forest. And for anybody who's unfamiliar with it, the bottom line findings were that if you know, you lose about 10% of your body weight through a combination of diet and exercise, you can get a symptom improvement of about 50%. But mechanistically, there's a lot of things that we don't necessarily know about what's going on. And so Hope, I guess with that prelude, can you just tell us a little bit more about what you found in the recent study? Yeah, so like you mentioned, the purpose of this whole um, project was really kind of an offshoot of the overarching IDEA trial. And so, you know, we know that a lot of the times patients are told to lose weight when they are diagnosed with OA or have very severe symptoms. And as many of us know, we can do that in very different ways, like you mentioned, through diet, exercise, or combined diet and exercise. And so while we know that this is something that, you know, patients aren't being told, our goal was to kind of work with Dr. Messier as well as Dr. Lozier to really see what are the actual metabolic mechanisms you know, and really what is kind of happening at this really tiny level that Ron mentioned. So really, you know, going beyond this idea of weight loss as well as symptoms, but really seeing if there are any differences that are caused by these specific weight loss interventions at this small level. So overall, we found that our pilot analysis really aligned with the overarching trial, that we see that there are a lot of metabolic differences between our three groups, which again, were diet, exercise, or combined diet and exercise. And while all these patients had OA, you know, and had very severe disease, and they also were different ages, different BMIs, as well as um, an even ratio of males to females, we see that there are a lot of differences between these three intervention groups. Um, and some of these were related to things like vitamin, metabolism, lipids, amino acids, as well as a few others. And so this was really, really exciting to see that, you know, we really see a lot of these differences between these three types of interventions that are all considered weight loss interventions. And something that was really exciting to us too is that we also saw that there were a lot of male and female differences. And more so we saw that these male and female differences really kept coming up even within their intervention group, AKA males that were just part of the exercise group look very different from females that were in the same exercise group. And so that was really exciting for us as well. Now, I, I, I recognize that it's a very small sample, but when you just, extrapolate a little bit further on that comment that you just made about males in the exercise group. What are you saying? Yeah, so we did only have 30 patients in our pilot trial. That was kind of an offshoot of the whole idea trial. And we did collect three time point samples from them, which I forgot to mention at baseline, six months and 18 months. And so we looked at kind of what met metabolites or what patterns are changing over these 18 months. And more so we found that essentially the metabolome of our males looked very different from our females out of all 30 of our um, participants, as well as when we broke it down by their intervention group. And so this was kind of shocking to us that, you know, if you have a male that's on the same intervention as a female, you might expect them to look alike within their intervention group. However, they didn't. And so this really supports the notion that one, osteoarthritis is a lot more common amongst females um, and they often experience more severe OA. However, we don't know much about why that is. And so that's something that Dr. June and I are very interested in. And so this study kind of further kind of excited us to really look into differences between males and females, especially males and females that have OA as their prevalence is very different. Yeah. And I, I guess just by way of uh, publicity, because it's an area that's, I guess, rapidly emerging. Uh, we have a thematic issue coming out in the journal relatively soon, focused specifically 
on those sex differences, which I think is a really emerging hot topic. And, you know, mm -hmm. historically, you know, the, the disconnect we have there between the preclinical models that we study, which are predominantly young male mice to the human disease, which is a largely older female disease is, uh, is really staggering. Ron? Well, and Hope's perhaps being a little modest there, one, she published another paper in OAC a year-ish ago, looking at the synovial fluid of patients after various injuries to their knees that was collected at uh, the time of arthroscopy. And one of the really interesting findings from that study was that we, we found a difference in uh, a fatty acid called servonal carnitine, which appears to be metabolized differently between male and female patients, suggesting that potentially some of the cells in the joint are using different fuel sources, which, which I think could have, you know, if we can repeat that in other cohorts, that could have pretty interesting downstream effects, both in understanding what's going on in the pathophysiology, as well as potentially different, uh, you know, indicating different treatments for men and women. Fantastic. Hope, did you want to expand on that? Just a little bit. Um, I think between some of the work that's come from our lab over the years is we've kind of really aligned with the field that, you know, there's been a lot more traction to look into male-female differences, which is really exciting, which is kind of what even led us to really investigate this. So we're at kind of a global view, looking at our three intervention groups that were age-matched, BMI-matched, as well as male, male and female-matched. We looked at our three groups in terms of DM interventions. And because of some of the findings that we've been seeing in other work, as well as other um, labs looking into male-female differences, that's kind of what led us to even do that initial analysis. And it really led to a fruitful analysis here between our males and females. And a quick note that I think blows my mind is that it was only in 1993 that the NIH mandated that males and females should both be incorporated and involved into human trials. And nothing like that has happened in the um, animal space. And that's for all fields, not just the ortho field and things like that. And so I think it's really important to note that 1993 was not that long ago at all. And hopefully a lot of this work as well as work by others really helps and um, kind of incite some change on that front too. Exactly. Yeah. It's so it's sorely needed. So Hope, back to the topic at hand, and obviously, particularly as it relates to the study and gaining further insights and some of the changes that you've found, can you just tell us a little bit more about the insights that you've got there around systemic metabolism? Yeah, so with our three intervention groups, I'll start with the diet and exercise group. So this was the group that I would say, quote unquote, performed the best in terms of the overarching idea trial. They lost the most weight. And specifically to our pilot analysis, we saw that they had um, a lot of elevated lipid related pathways, such as the carnitine shuttle, as well as involving fatty acids, like Ron mentioned. And so this was really interesting to us of where it's possible that this combined diet and exercise may be causing these OA ind individuals to really tap into different biofuels, such as lipids to kind of meet energy demands during um, end stage disease. However, when we went to look at the diet group alone and the exercise group alone, we didn't really see the same thing, which was very interesting because this was our combined group. So in our diet group alone, we saw a lot of energy associated pathways such as gly glycolysis, which many people maybe have, have heard about. And so these kind of energy pathways were very interesting to us. And it's possible that the diets that these individuals were on being in the diet intervention group could cause them to use kind of different metabolic mechanisms, such as these energy ones, to really kind of fight away or kind of how they just are metabolically active during this end stage disease. And then lastly, in our exercise group, we saw a lot of anti-inflammatory effects. And this has been well documented that exercise has been shown to have a lot of anti-inflammatory effects. So it was very exciting to us that we saw this at the small level of the metabolome and a lot of amino acids popped up. So these are the um, building blocks of proteins. And we saw some of these amino acids have been found in another um, kind of offshoot or pilot trial that was associated with the um, IDEA trial already. And a lot, of, um, a lot of amino acids have gained traction in the field of OA and that these could be potential metabolic markers of OA. And so it was very interesting that these markers really came up in our exercise group. 
So all in all, that was a ton of information, but really we found that there were kind of distinct metabolic themes that were associated with each intervention group and that they were really different from each other of where some of them had lipids, some were more focused on energy and others were more focused on amino acids. And so this was really interesting to us because again, all of these individuals had OA and all of them were assigned to a type of, of, of intervention group. And so it's also possible that this is something to consider as a patient, as well as doctors that are kind of recommending people to lose weight. And it's possible that different weight loss measures will also work differently for different people, as we see here being on combined or just diet alone or exercise alone. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's important to state that all three of the groups that were involved in the study all improved as far as their symptoms are concerned. But at least from a diet and exercise perspective, that group appeared to improve more than others. And uh, we do have at least a little bit of insights, both from this study, but also from previous studies about the benefits as far as inflammation is concerned. But Hope, I just wonder, and again, if I'm extrapolating too far, is there any merit or benefit from the metabolic changes that you saw, particularly as it relates to energy use, comparing the diet to the diet and exercise arm to suggest that there's a preferential change in metabolism that might favor one group over another? So that's a really good question. That's something I have really thought about a lot, especially when we were writing up this paper. Unfortunately, one of the limitations in our eyes is that we don't have samples from healthy individuals, as well as OA and individuals that weren't on any type of intervention. So I think if we did incorporate those, that might kind of give us a more clear answer to your question. I also think it is very important to consider, again, maybe individuals might enjoy or be more successful at losing weight with different interventions than what they were assigned. So I think those are really key things to consider. But through my eyes as a biochemist, we see that the combined diet and exercise group lost the most weight and they looked very distinct from the other groups. So I think just with that knowledge, of course, it would be great to combine both diet and exercise to lose weight effectively. Um, and that's been very much, I would say, kind of preached to a lot of people in various fields, as well as kind of over time that in order to effectively lose weight, you have to lead a very healthy lifestyle as well as be active. But purely from a biochemist point of view, it's really hard to say which one is, is um, better, but because they lost the most weight, I would probably pick that intervention. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, um, Ron, whether it be through diet and exercise or exercise or diet alone, but I guess one of the other areas that's rapidly exploding at the moment is the use of pharmacologic agents to assist with weight loss. What we're seeing, at least experientially, is that a lot of people, when they're on these things, do well, but when they stop, they may not necessarily do well. Are there any insights that you can give us about the durability of these metabolic changes? So in this study, there was a terminal 18 month time point. So I, I should start out by saying we don't have any insight into that, but my suspicion would be that, you know, if patients were to revert to their pre-trial diet and pre-trial, perhaps lack of exercise, that the changes would not be durable. However, of the changes that we see afterward, and I would love to someday convince a funding agency to fund a study like this, we could potentially separate the, the changes into durable versus variable or transient changes by, say, sampling every week, for instance, to see what that transient population of metabolites is and separate them from the durable ones. Um, and that we don't have that data yet, but that would, if we can do that someday, I would really like to, to see which ones truly are durable, which would provide more insight. And remember here, we're looking at the metabolites from the serum of these patients. So these serum metabolites are kind of representative of metabolomic changes that are happening in the circulation systemically. And I think as a, as an osteoarthritis research community, we still have a lot to learn about the interplay between systemic factors and local factors in the joint. And so there, there's still a lot to learn, but this is at least a starting spot. Yeah, no, and it's a, it's a great starting place. Now, Hope or Ron, do you have any other comments that you want to make about either this study or metabolomics in general before we get on to a few other closing questions? 
I think one thing to point out too is that I was just thinking about the many, many Excel files that we have for the pilot trial as well as the overarching trial. So like I mentioned, we had samples from these individuals at zero or baseline, six, six months and 18 months. And in a few patients, we saw that they did really well from zero to six months. They lost weight as well as in the overarching trial. Um, it's not surprising that we can do something for six months and you know feel pretty good about it. However, from the six month to 18 month time point, from our pilot analysis, a lot more patients didn't lose weight as rapidly or even gained weight. So while their net weight loss over 18 months, they did lose weight. However, we did see that in our data that they kind of had a bit of a harder time kind of maintaining this weight loss from you know zero all the way to 18 months. And so one of the things that we did is we did look into changes in the serum metabolome from zero to six months, as well as six months to 18 months. All in all, all of our data in this in this paper are representing changes from zero to 18 months, but that was something that we looked into because some patients did not really sustain the weight loss over, over 18 months, which is totally understandable. That's a really long time. So I think that kind of goes along with what Ron was saying is that it's hard to assess the durability of this in terms of how durable it is at the metabolomic level, because it's really important to note how durable this kind of lifestyle intervention actually is for, for patients, especially if they may be limited by their activity status, how well they can move as well as access to maybe healthy foods to really um, help that diet piece. So wonderful. And I would maybe just add about metabolomics. If there are any researchers listening, do not be intimidated. It is challenging, but I think all of there are a lot more tools that make it easier to uh, to work in now. And I think there's an immense amount that we can learn as an osteoarthritis community, research community from applying these methods. And on that note of uh, great optimism, what we might do is move into, I guess, your thoughts on improving health and healthcare. So if you had a magic wand that you could wave, funding were limitless, what would you do? I mean, I really think that one thing we did learn from the IDEA trial is that if we can provide some education for patients on the benefits of weight loss and exercise, they will feel better. So I would say, you know, eat well and move your joints every day and your joints will thank you. Yeah. It's a great place to start, Hope. Yeah. So I think you made a good point, at least if like funding weren't a problem, then that would obviously be great. I think one, this paper, as well as the overarching idea trial really shows what we can do when we have funding to really do these large scale investigations that involve multiple patients, multiple time points, getting their x-rays, pain, pain measures, blood samples, urine samples, everything like these these patients that were in this um, trial were amazing because we have so much data on them, so so many samples, things like that. So that's amazing. And so I think this just goes to show that in a perfect world, the sky is the absolute limit. I think my best advice for patients out there is to one, be your own advocate and two, really get in touch with local or state representatives to really increase awareness as those in individuals can really lobby and advocate for more ortho and funding in general for science. And so of course, that kind of doesn't really answer your own question, but I think in all reality, we really need to focus a lot of our efforts there as a field, as well as at the um, patient level to really help people understand that this is a major problem and we need funding to really make a huge, a huge, huge difference. But at the patient level, advocate for yourself as well as for ortho research. Yeah. There's a little bit that everybody can do there, but I, I really hope they pay attention to you, particularly from a, an advocacy and funding perspective, Hope. Now, why do you do what you do? What's the primary motivation that drives you? So when I was in college, I began doing research when I was a junior, but I was a CNA or a certified nursing assistant since I was a freshman in um, college because I wanted to go to med school and I wanted to get exposure there. And while I was a CNA, I was on the general surgical floor. So I was working with patients that were having total knee and total hip surgeries every single day whether they were, you know, 
50 or 80 individuals of all backgrounds. And I just remember taking care of them immediately after surgery, as well as, you know, getting them to a transition home. And so I think of them a lot. I think of them when I'm looking at all the data for these various trials, such as this one, and, you know, looking at, oh, this, this person is 50, they're a female, this is their BMI. And just really remembering that all of those individuals are people, they're moms, dads, you know, sisters, brothers, all that. And so I always think about the patients that I took care of back in the day. And that's what ultimately really kind of fuels my fire to really investigate a lot of these big, big questions with osteoarthritis, because that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Any closing comments or thoughts from either of you? I guess, um, if, if for patients out there, if you've read about any controversy in the literature or heard about it regarding the mechanisms behind why exercise might work, I would say that ultimately the mechanisms behind why exercise or perhaps education might work in improving your symptoms for your joint don't really matter. What matters is that you get out there and move your joints. And that should, based on the literature, most likely make them feel better. And I hope they listen to you, Ron, because as as you say, it's more important that they get better and feel better rather than understand necessarily what intimately is happening to each muscle fiber and how that might be improving their symptoms. Hope, any final thoughts? Um, my last thought would be just to ask ask any type of, of question that you may have, whether you're a patient in your doctor's office, I think, do not be afraid to ask any type of question, you know, hey, I read about this. Is this real? you know, or I think maybe I would like to do this type of activity or this type of exercise. Do you think that I'll be able to do that? Do you think maybe like doing cycling might be better for me? Like definitely be very creative in your ways of um, movement. I think going off of what Ron said, and don't be afraid to ask any, any type of question to your doctor or anything like that. And I think that goes to researchers just like Ron and I don't, don't be afraid to ask those big, big questions because you never know if you'll actually be able to investigate it like we did here. Um, a lot of these questions and a lot of the perspectives that Ron and I had for this um, paper in this in this trial really kind of came true thanks to a lot of the questions that we've had for, for years and years. So don't be afraid to ask questions whether you're a patient, doctor, researcher, whoever. Great way to close because, you know, as, as I frequently say, gaining knowledge um, and improving your educational base is incredibly empowering and if people can get out there and ask appropriate questions and get better informed about their disease and how best to look after themselves they'll be a lot better off for it now i hope ron thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us for the wonderful work that you're doing um hopefully we can continue to interact in this space but again really appreciate the time that you shared with us today thank you so we really dug deep down into changes in chemistry, and metabolites, um, and fundamental differences between men, women, and the important changes that might occur in our metabolism through diet, exercise, and the combination. I'm hoping that that will spark further interest from you in changes that might be occurring in your metabolism, and hopefully stimulate opportunities for you to both learn about opportunities for you to change your metabolism, through, whether that be through diet, exercise, or another means. Um, but the important role that that might play both in your health and in your disease. Obviously, underpinning all of this is we know that diet and exercise is beneficial for people that are above a healthy weight with osteoarthritis, both as far as symptoms are concerned but you know fundamentally as we heard today the metabolic changes that might occur with that and the changes that might be occurring there whether it be related to inflammation uh, energy production or other changes in our metabolism hopefully that stimulates you to continue to remain adherent to changes that you might have made in your behavior and continue to stimulate others around you follow a similar path thank you again so much for your continued support of the Joint Action Podcast. Really looking forward to the opportunity to share new insights with you again in the not too distant future. But between now and then, please do take care of yourself. Thanks for listening to Joint Action with David Hunter. If you like our show and want to know more, visit www.jointaction.info. 
If you have any questions, you can email us at hello at jointaction.info and follow us on Twitter at jointactionorg. This podcast was hosted by David Hunter, edited by Vicky Duong, music produced by Jordan Hunter. The information posted on this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Anyone seeking medical advice should consult a health professional.